Hope you're having a great time wherever you are, uh, or whatever time it might be. I'm calling in from New York City. It's been raining all week, so not the most exciting week. Uh, but I'm excited to bring you Scaling uh, Industrial AI for uh, with 51 Teams. We'll be talking about how some industrial companies in the world today are uh, facing the challenges that we are all facing today in the AI ecosystem and how they're overcoming them by scaling their systems uh, through uh, well-kept data collections, data sets, as well as automation that scales their systems uh, into the future. So a little bit about uh, myself and Voxel51. Uh, Voxel51, we are the lead maintainers of the open source project 51, but we're also the developers of 51 Teams. Um, 51 Teams, we'll get into it more later, is our enterprise version that sits on top of our open source version. Uh, what exactly is a voxel? A voxel is to a video what a pixel is to an image. It's that volume element that gives it the time to a video. And what is 51? It's a good question. It's that old inside joke going back to some of our co-founders. Um, if anyone has any good guesses, drop them in the chat, and I will let you know if anyone uh, hit the nail on the head. Uh, but my name's Dan. I'm an ML engineer and developer evangelist at Voxel51. I've been doing machine learning for seven to eight years now, and uh, I'm excited to bring you all about what I've learned in my experience uh, in the industrial space. Uh, so the first thing that's always going to be evidently clear uh, in the industrial space or any other space uh, is that not all data is perfect. Uh, whether it's low sample size, low variety, or just poor quality data, this has been an obstacle for computer vision for decades. Uh, previously, uh, we've just been limited by the resources we have to collect more data, uh, to manage our data, to hold our data, uh, compute to process some of that data. Right now, we can have, uh, you can think about it by having better cameras, faster cameras. Uh, we have more um, faster CPUs, right times, right? We can just move this data around a lot more effectively using the cloud and other systems than we could previously. And we were just limited by our understanding on how to overcome some of these data gaps. So even when you have minimal amount of data, and this is affecting your model quality, we previously just don't know as much as we, we know today to kind of overcome these problems. Uh, this kind of corresponds, of course, with the field of visual AI and computer vision exploding. Uh, the amount of research AI is expanding exponentially. We have two graphs here. They both stopped in 2020. Uh, but you can see that we're just going skyrocket up. And, you know, one of the big shifts that has come along with this new, uh, ex you know, uh, expanse of research has that been that state-of-the-art models are no longer an annual event, but they're more like monthly, if not weekly events. This is very important when we begin to think about the shift of how we used to think about AI systems, AI workflows, especially when you think about your own ML pipelines at whatever companies you might be working at. Uh, because now we've been moving more towards this data-centric AI, right? Uh, this is a overall across the board, whether you work in language or if you work in images, robotics, wherever it might be, the whole field is shifting more towards the data because they've realized that the data, not the model, is the most important piece of a successfully deployed model. Uh, you can see some examples down here that, right, we should be iterating constantly on our models, right? We should be constantly trying to collect more data, whatever that is either data deployed, maybe we got some data collected, maybe it's more annotations that we've made, we paid for. Then we're gonna train a model. Great. Then we're gonna deploy that model into production. If it's gonna be, you know, this is after we have evaluated our model, we made sure that it's better than our previous model. Now we're iterating, we deploy into production, but the whole time that we're going forward, we're also looking backwards, right? Is there ways for us to check out the evaluation to find gaps in our data set? Maybe we have uh, some biases in our data set. Our data set has begun to drift. Uh, maybe we need to get more annotations in a specific area of our data set. Likewise, we can use the model that we trained to find mislabeled an annotations, right? Uh, our model is 90% confident that that's a dog, but it was labeled cat. Can we go through and clean up all these issues? And can we also use this model to find things like our hardest images, images that don't really look like the rest of them, right? We can use embeddings to explore the distribution of our data set. And this is kind of this workflow, this cycle uh, that, you know, previously we weren't iterating on before with model-centric AI, right? It was all about trying to build uh, the right model for the right problem, right? How many layers do I need? Should I be 
adding dropout layers and training, like all this kind of really sophisticated model architecture uh, stuff that we're no kind of longer thinking about as much, right? Now we're kind of thinking about it as this full stack experience where the model's placed in the middle and our data is the most important part. Uh, a lot of this comes with uh, the fact that models are replaceable now, and it's for a good reason. Uh, models are getting better and better each year. If you check out uh, papers with code, we have some charts here from object detection on Coco or semantic segmentation. You can see that uh, not only do we have over the years just a ton of more models uh, as we move to the right, uh, but we can see that uh, these models are coming in different flavors. These models are always getting better. And so we want to be prepared as machine learning engineers to always be able to kind of swap these models out in the case of something happening, right? Uh, it could be something very dramatic. It could be something like a critical vulnerability found in this model. It could be something that like a stunning breakthrough has happened. And now there's a model that's just that much better than the previous one. Uh, and what's going to take, what's going to make the most difference between you and your competitors or a successful, uh, a successful project versus an unsuccessful project is that speed at which you can pivot, right? If you're able to have set up your stack in a way where your data is well managed, it's high quality, it's kind of ready to go in any format. Uh, the moment that new model comes out, you can just drop that new model in, train right away with the existing data set you have and then kind of jump right into evaluation where you can compare your old model to the new model. And if everything checks out and the new model really is that much better than your previous model, you're ready to ship right away, right? It could be, this could all be done within less than a week going from a previous model in production to a new model in production, uh, just because you've been ready to kind of switch on the model side uh, the whole time, right? So trying to find and set up these ML pipelines which are taking in data and just constantly iterating on making that data set as high quality as possible, getting the best evaluation parameters, right? Uh, understanding where the best and most important places to evaluate are. That way, whenever a new model comes out or you are training a new model, you can always swap out, compare multiple models to another model, right? Um, you know, the, the, the name of the game here is to continually iterate, right? And the faster you iterate, the faster and more you'll stay ahead of the competition. So that kind of goes into like, well, how do we make these data sets better, right? Of course, I can get more data. Of course, I can annotate more data. But what really makes my data set better? And what do I need to be looking in my data sets uh, to make them better? Uh, and so the name of the game nowadays is uh, data curation, right? And data curation is no longer an option to consider, right, uh, in your data sets, right? You have to be doing this. This is something that must happen. Uh, you have to be doing data creation because we have issues in the real world that we didn't really consider before, right? The number one and number two one are going to be data bias and data model drift. Uh, with data bias, maybe you're not representing uh, your data set as best as you possibly can, right? We think about this uh, anytime you make a data set on humans and people. It's a very difficult problem as humans and people can look many different ways, whether it's uh, gender, occupation, age, um, you know, country, ethnicity, whatever it might be. Uh, if these are not all properly represented, then your model has a high probability to then drift, sway, give inaccurate results when it is inferencing on one of these minority or marginalized groups. Likewise, the same thing kind of applies with data model drift, right? If you are training your model in the middle of summer and then winter comes and all the leaves fall off the tree and now there's snow on the ground and all these things are happening, if you're not ready to train your model for that data as well, if it's not already prepared for this uh, changing environment that the model is being deployed in, uh, then your model is not going to perform well, right? So we always need to be ready to kind of address these problems uh, through data curation to make sure our data sets are well balanced and that they're always going to be training on samples that they're going to be uh, encountering in the field. Some other ones to keep in mind that aren't, uh, you know, they don't come up as much as data bias. They're not as uh, significant potentially uh, as you can probably find them uh, using good tools like 51 pretty quickly are things like volatile data and outliers, right? We wanna make sure that our data is, um, we're gonna catch any bad images. We're gonna make sure that all our images are high quality, that there's no, uh, you know, one of the most common ones, especially in camera applications is imagine if you have a camera on a dash cam 
and you give this camera to 100 cars to go collect some data for a data set, well, like probably one out of 100 of those cars will not set up the dash cam correctly, right? So can we catch those images of the guy who didn't set up the dash cam correctly? Half of it is pointed, you know, at the ground or at the dashboard or something like that. Uh, we want to remove that data so our model's not training on poor images, right? We only want to be training on high quality images or at least images it will be expecting to see in the field. Uh, lastly, we want to make sure we're checking for anything like annotation mistakes. This will just improve your overall accuracy of your model, right? Even in very popular data sets like MS Coco or Open Images, it's riddled with annotation mistakes. Uh, and we can clean those up to train to higher performance. And then lastly, uh, we want to always be aware of bad actors, especially in the enterprise deployed environment. Uh, you never know who might be trying to uh, sabotage or mess with your data sets. So uh, scanning through to make sure you don't have anything like hidden back doors, uh, doing things like data set versioning to always be able to roll back your data sets is always a good practice when it comes to data curation. So all of this what we're uh, accumulating towards is the solution is to put your data at the center of your stack, right? Uh, we can see that about a third of all model errors are due to just bad data. And then if we improve that quality, we can make the models better. More importantly, we wanna make sure that we're not wasting our time doing all this data wrangling, doing all this data curation. And we can see that today, about two thirds of ML teams are wasting their time on just time wrangling tasks, right? Whether it's diving into folders, or trying to move the data around, we don't wanna be doing this. ML engineers should be showing up to work and doing their work on the first day, right? You clock in and it's time to do real ML work. Real ML work does not include downloading folders from online, moving folder files away, making sure the folder file formats are in this you know, correct order or whatever it might be, uh, You know, trying to load it into a Pandas data frame. Uh, we wanna make sure that when you show up to do your ML work, you're doing real ML work and not just folder wrangling. Uh, and so with the right stack, with the right uh, production mindset, uh, you, you can get to production with these high quality models and push them out fast. Um, because without the right AI stack, uh, independent studies have found that about 85% of all projects uh, ultimately fail, whether it's for one reason or another. Uh, if you don't have the right stack, if you're not thinking about the, the current ecosystem and AI uh, correctly, then your project will most likely not make it to production. So we're gonna be taking a look at how 51 can kind of help and aid all these tasks that we've just been talking about, right? 51 is a data set refinery, almost like a data set debugger for your visual AI data sets, where you can load in your data sets, whatever format they may be. Uh, and then we can actually extend it, use it in all these other tools that you're probably already using today, plug right into it. So with 51, we can support local, remote, or cloud data with 51 teams. We can integrate with all the popular open source annotation tools like CVAT, Label Studio, V7, but we can also plug into a lot of the automated annotation tools of today, like SAM2, uh, SAM1, uh, other Alvit, whatever uh, open world language models you're interested in using, 51 has uh, plugins for, or they're in our model zoo. And we can also integrate with your model training and experiment tracking. So when it comes time to train, whether you're looping through PyTorch, you need to export to uh, something like Ultralytics, or you just want to plug into MLflow to see how your models are training, uh, this all plugs into the current existing form of 51. So you can track all of your different parts of your model lifestyle. Now, this is by no means to say that uh, you should be doing all your work in 51 and everything. No, that, that's not how it's... Uh, meant to be really what 51 is all about is uh, all about being a single source of truth for your data sets, right? So when we're looking through this video of a car driving data set here, you can see we're quickly finding things like misclassification where all these samples are labeled night. We can tag all these samples that are labeled night. We, uh, you can see that when we turn on our annotations, we wanna make sure that they're all crisp and clean. And then that way we're just managing all of those things that I mentioned before that the mistakes are out of our data set, the images are high quality, that we're getting all those outliers. And then from there, you're able to bring in as much as you like uh, to fill out the rest of your stack, right? Whether you're doing QA on annotations only and your only job is doing data set cleaning and things like that, 51 is great. If you wanna carry it all the way to model training, we can actually compare and contrast multiple models on one data set to see exactly which one is performing better than the other.
And so 51 supports all popular visual AI tasks, whether it's things like classification, detection, instant segmentation, polygons, polylines, point clouds, geolocation, embeddings, and more. As long as it's an image, a video, or 3D data, we can make a data set of any combination of, of those three. So it's very common for things like self-driving data sets uh, to have multiple camera feeds coming into your, um, your system, as well as point clouds, LIDAR, radar sensors. Uh, we can load those all into one place and kind of evaluate our data sets. So we're all going to be seeing how this all plays into industrial AI uh, in our use case today. And so we're going to take an example of being at a bottle factory, right? We're going to be looking at the MV Tech AD data set. This is one of the most popular industrial data sets of AI today. It features a bunch of different small components that are being made in a factory, such as, uh, you know, different electronic components, uh, some materials, some pills, bottles, uh, nuts, and more. Uh, and we're going to be taking a specific look at just the bottles today. So I'm going to head over to our uh, data set here. This is in 51 Teams. And so let's start with just our use case here, right? So we can see uh, we have all these bottles here and these bottles have different types of chips on them, right? So we can see there's some big chips, there's some smaller chips and uh, some bottles are actually completely okay, right? Like these bottles down here look pretty solid to me. Uh, so we, when we load our data set in, uh, they're all gonna come in with these two uh, labels and there's one more we'll get to, but you know, we gotta, we'll, we'll get there when we get there. Uh, so first, these are all in the bottle. If you use the MD Tech uh, data set, you'll notice that the categories, you have different data set types as pills and things like that. Uh, but we're looking at just the bottles today. Uh, and then for the defects, we have three main types of defects and then our good form. So uh, we can see we have some small broken bottles. So when we click on this, it'll look through all of our data set and get all of our small broke breaks. Uh, but we can also take a look at our big breaks here and we can see these are much worse and easier to find. And then the last one that maybe we haven't really considered, uh, but is also a form of uh, degradation is some type of contamination, right? This is either uh, the bottle wasn't fully made correctly. Now there's something in it, or there seemed to have been a leak or rust or something that kind of leaked into the bottom of this bottle. And so that we cannot ship it uh, when it comes time to, uh, you know, fill it up with some, hopefully some good soda pop or something like that. Uh, so the task that we have at hand today is we want to create a model that there is going to be a uh, assembly line, which is, you know, pushing all these bottles out. We have a camera at the top of the assembly line that is looking down through the bottle. And we want to be able to detect any of these breaks so that those bottles are being pushed off the assembly line. Now, uh, there's a lot of things to consider when we do this, right? One, we need to make sure that the model is very fast, right? Uh, we want to make sure that our model is always uh, increasing very quickly on all these bottles. We might be looking at potentially 50, if not 100 bottles per second. Uh, can we inference fast enough to kind of handle this use case? <clears throat> the second thing we want to consider is when we come to training and when it comes to our warehouse, we might have many different types of bottles coming in, right? So while we have 83 bottles here today, uh, these bottles might change over time. Maybe it's a new promotion. Uh, maybe it's a new brand. Maybe I'm making, uh, you know, Coke bottles day one, but then on day two, I make Sprite bottles, right? And do I really want to be switching multiple models out, right? So how do we account for this data drift? Um, and when it comes time to build these systems out, build these pipelines, how am I building it out in a way where I'm constantly iterating, right? But we talked about that before. So uh, it all starts with maintaining that good data set. And this is kind of how it looks like in 51 Teams. So the first thing you want to do is uh, you want to import your new samples, right? And we can import samples very easily. We just kind of do import type. Uh, you can pick whether that's media, labels, or media and labels. So let's say it's media and labels. Uh, we can pick one of your favorite data set types, whatever one it's going to be, uh, such as the Coco data set. You're going to have to type in a new field. Uh, we'll just call this new field for now. Um, and then you pick where that data set lives in your directory. Once you do that, all those images can be automatically loaded in. And when they're automatically loaded in, we can do all sorts of automation on top of them. That's just things like uh, automatically generating uh, image quality issues to make sure that none of them are too dark, too bright, none of the cameras are mispositioned. 
We can also do things like generate embeddings on them automatically or run our existing model on top of them to see what the results are compared to uh, what they were labeled as. So all this is kind of automatically, uh, you know, automated and running through. Uh, and when we do that, we're now going to train our model uh, to see how we can detect these bottles. So if you're interested in which model I trained, it's actually available on our documentation. Uh, if you head over to the 51 docs, I believe it's under uh, tutorials and it is under, let me look it up. It's anomaly detection. Here we go. Oop, I clicked the wrong link. If you want to check out how the full length of this example works, check out the anomaly detection um, example where we're using Anomalib is one of the open Vino toolkits models. If we check it out and move down, there's all these really great uh, models that Anomalib includes. And the best thing about that I like about from Anomalib is that it trains really fast, right? Anomalib only needs to train a couple epochs in order to get really good results. And so what we're seeing in this one has only trained for five epochs on very small amount of data, right? And so with this, you can get very high results. And the whole point here is to try to get a segmentation mask uh, and define these defects that we were previously looking at. So this for a full length uh, tutorial, check out this tutorial on anomaly detection, where you can look through all the different defects, trained very easily. It's all unsupervised. So you don't even have to uh, uh, label this data. It'll just naturally find the defects it just won't label the defects as small break and big break. It'll just say defect or no defect. Uh, so with that in mind, let's head back, right? So now that we have our task at hand, uh, we have this ground truth mask, right? This is where our defect mask is. And this is what we're ultimately trying to detect um, with our model. So like I mentioned, I trained very quickly on only five epochs. I did it unsupervised. So when my new data set came in, I automatically trained a new model on them. It didn't have any labels on it. It didn't have to go through any pre-processing. I just sent the data straight from 51 into the model for five epochs. And then I got the model out and I added all the results right to my 51 data set. So we can actually see uh, with this, I'm gonna turn off some of these labels so we can see whether or not we're correct or not right. Uh, we can see right away heat map as well as a defect mask on our data set. So I'm going to change some of the colors here so it's a little bit uh, easier for us to see them. Um, but when I turn on our heat map, we can see exactly where our model is focusing. So we can see and learn how our model is uh, thinking about the problem, as well as we can begin to compare and contrast our unsupervised model to our ground truths. So we can see with only 83 samples here, in a five epoch training run, so very small training run, we've loaded our data set in and we can see right away that we're getting right a, a pretty good mass on, on top of all of our defects. All of this happened automatically. I didn't trust any of the training parameters. All I did was pick the model PADM uh, from Anomalib. And we can see right away how sharp a lot of these results are on our defects. But, you know, it's all well and good if you get the defects. How well do you do on the actual good bottles? If you're saying that every bottle is a defect, then that's not a very good model, is it? So when we go back down here, we can see that when the model is good, majority of the time we're nailing the fact, right? We have a couple times here where we're getting some false positives. But with some more data, more than only 83 samples, I'm sure a lot of these will come out as well. So this is all how you can kind of load in your industrial data sets. You're looking for those anomalies on your warehouse lines, whatever the factory lines are. You can automatically load those samples into 51 and in only a couple clicks, train this unsupervised model to catch 95% or more of your anomalies uh, at a fast inference rate, all automatically. So it's a very powerful way. Once again, if you're interested in checking it out yourself, check out anomaly detection here on our 51 documentation. And if you're interested to learn more about 51 teams, uh, whether that's things like how you can data set version your data sets, right? I could always say first model, right? Since the first model that I ever trained, uh, I could always uh, save this snapshot and always roll back to this data set. So that way, if I train more models, my data comes in more and more and more. If I ever want to go back to the original data set, I can always roll back to my original snapshot. I can also see whatever work is going on, or I can invite whoever I like to my data set. So whenever I go over here, I can see exactly who has access to this data set. 
I can see I'm the only one right now. So maybe I want to add my friend Jacob to the data set. Well, I can just uh, type in Jacob here. It's going to look through all the people that work at my company. I find Jacob. Uh, I trust Jacob pretty well. He can manage my data set for me. And I am going to give him the permissions to do so. So with 51 teams, you're going to get access to all that I spoke about before as well. This collaboration, uh, permissioning, security, and more uh, all in one product. So if you're interested in learning more about 51 Teams, just shoot me a message online or, uh, you know, if you go to our webpage, you can always try to schedule a workshop or a demo uh, if you are interested. Uh, you, if so, you might be uh, hearing again from me soon. But that's all I have uh, for you today. I hope you enjoyed this quick insight into industrial AI. And I hope that, you know, you can take some of the learnings that you have today from either uh, the excellent GPU talk that we had earlier or this talk more about data sets and data curation and really empower your AI workflows of the future. Thank you, everyone.